some students from uh, next door because I'm I'm re I'm presenting this to you from sunny Georgia in a small private language school of a friend of mine. Uh, so today uh, we're going to talk about tuning in to the teenage audience with authenticity, and I think um, it's quite interesting if we look at millennials and and how they learn. Uh, because the teenagers that we teach today are nothing like we were ourselves as teenagers. Um, these students have lower attention spans, they tend to be quite passive in class, and they look for the teacher to use edutainment to get them engaged. They're, they've got so much information available that they're, they're overloaded with it, and so therefore suffer from short-term memory loss. And they struggle with processing all this information, uh, so we really need to help them with, with critical thinking skills. Now, I've been teaching for about 30 years, and actually on the, on the year I was born, in 1968, the British government had a little bit of money for, um, for educational research, and they, they, they did a big project in 1968 where they went to secondary schools, they went to over 200 secondary schools with this specific aim of finding out how long a teenager could stay focused to a teacher. And in 1968, it was about 14 and a half minutes. And of course, uh, they did it 30 years later in 1998, and it had shrunk to just under five minutes. Now, the, the British government hasn't had money since for that type of research, unfortunately, but I think we as practicing teachers know that, that this is a sort of downward slope as opposed to, to, to something that's increasing. Another thing we have to consider, of course, is, is, you know, we've talked about digital natives and digital immigrants for a long time, but, but these expressions are a little bit outdated now. Uh, these days we refer to, to digital residents, uh, people who, who live and operate in a digital world. They feel very comfortable using technology, and, and digital visitors who sort of dip in and dip out uh, my gr my mother's one. I mean, she struggles to print off a boarding pass, not even realizing that you don't need a boarding pass on a piece of paper anymore. So we've got a lot of things to consider. Um, one of the things that we need to look at, of course, is is how technology is is changing everything. Uh, if you look at the picture in front of you, you can see those wonderful fashion design, uh, wonderful fashion devices. Those devices are actually. Um, instantaneous translation devices. They're on the market this year. They're made by a company called Waverly Technology, and they cost under $200. So uh, you'll be able to buy one, pop one in your ear, and then if you've got a, a Chinese friend, he'll put one in his ear, you'll speak in English, and it'll translate instantaneously into, uh, into Chinese so he can understand and comprehend what you're talking about. The, the other picture there, of course, is, is of the Babel fish, because, because back in the 80s, when Douglas Adams was writing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it was pure fantasy. But these days, uh, we certainly have technology all around us. Uh, as, as a teacher, we know that, that gone are the days of chalk and talk. There are lots of different methods and approaches that we can use for teaching English. M learning, mobile learning, nano learning, or you've probably heard of learning, which is, is learning through Google. Google is so confident on their voice recognition software that they feel happy to, to, to put it forward as a portal to learn languages. And of course, the, uh, the Amazon Echo, well, Alexi, of course, is the, the virtual assistant that, um, that, that has really made this piece of device one of the best-selling Christmas presents of last year. You, you come home, hard days teaching, you open the door, you say, hello, Alexi, and it lights up and it says, hello, Phil, how are you? Have you had a difficult day? And you say, hmm, yeah, can you play a bit of music? Music appears. Can you turn on the kitchen light? The kitchen light appears. So, so I think when we imagined we were learning languages to speak to humans, perhaps some of the, the millennials that we're teaching English to are not even going to use English to, to interact with another human. They're going to, to use it to interact with a, an interface. Um, and the, the, the rise of technology and the, the sophistication of it um, worries me completely because the only thing I've ever really done is teach English. 
And it's a little bit disturbing because all the, all the friends I know who teach English, they don't drive Porsches or live in mansions. Uh, so what are we going to do when we, we need a job? And um, I was looking back and I was thinking to myself, what other subjects, school subjects, have been affected by technology in my lifetime? And, and how have they evolved and how have they developed? And I was thinking back to my own secondary schools. And, and I was thinking about um, mathematics. Of course, when we learn mathematics, uh, the teacher would write lots of equations on the board. Um, and, and, and we'd have to try and analyze our numeracy. And it was quite difficult um, to, to, to process that information. But then in, in the, the mid-70s, every kid bought one of these scientific calculators that did absolutely everything for you. And of course, you began to, to, to feel a resistance from students. They said, well, we don't need maths. We've got these devices that can do it for us. And of course, through the, 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 the following decades, we can see that this, this resistance to, to, to the mathematics and, um, and how useful it is when we have devices that can do it all for us is, um, is, is very much part of the platform. But uh, I, think, I think all of us can say that, that there are two types of people. There are the types of people who can use maths innately, and there are the types of people for, for whom mathematics remains a mystery. Now, like any poor student, when I was uh, shopping for, for the usual student food, you know, baked beans and noodles and everything else, I take a trolley and I throw stuff into the trolley, and I'd be automatically calculating how much money I'd spent each time I put an item in there. So that when I got to the, the cashier's desk, uh, suddenly I knew how much to give them. But um, I was in Brighton about a, a couple of weeks ago, and I was staying in a nice cheap hotel, and, um, and it cost 48 pounds. And the, the pleasant Italian receptionist said to me, how would you like to play, pay Mr. Warwick? Card or cash? And I said, cash. And uh, she said, it's 48 pounds. And I, I unfurled three 20 pound notes from my wallet. And she looked at me aghast. And I, I thought, oh no, here we go. And she opened a drawer and she got out her smartphone. And, and I, I sort of put my head in my hands in despair. Uh, oh no. And she did. 60 minus 48. And, and so I thought to myself, you know, what, what's happened with mathematics in secondary school education? And I came across this, RME, uh, which stands, of course, for Realistic Mathematics Education. It was started just at the end of uh, the, the last century, you know, the 20th century, in the Netherlands. And um, what they tried to do was approach mathematics not as a, a content-driven subject, but as a skill. And um, it was embraced in, in uh, the UK, it has been for several years, uh, but initially through Manchester University, and it's been embraced in America and, and many different European countries. And some of the feedback from teachers uh, where, where the teachers were saying, well, the students, after we started teaching mathematics differently, uh, they stopped asking, what's the point of this? They stopped saying, can we do something different? And I, I stopped replying, we, we have to do it because you have an exam or a test. Well, these sort of comments, I feel, are sort of comments that English teachers themselves might say if they, if, if they had to change the way they were teaching. And of course, when we look at mathematics in the modern world, it's, it's less about trying to work out equations or, or, or dealing with abstract um, formulas. It's no longer a dry subject, but it's, it's connected to problem solving. So, so if you go into a, a school these days, the, the question is, OK, John has to meet his wife. Um, she lives uh, 100 kilometers away. He's driving to meet her at 70 kilometers an hour. And she's driving, she's a little bit more careful, she's driving at 30 kilometers an hour. Where will they meet? At what point will they meet? That type of thing. And of course, if you look at mathematics, you can see that there's, there's mathematical competence, which is this innate ability to think and solve problems and, and, and do it naturally. And, and I think, you know, like many English teachers, I'm not, maths is not my forte, 
but I can certainly see a crossover between mathematics and, and, and language learning because, of course, you have mathematical competence. Well, in, in language teaching, you've got communicative competence. And with communicative competence, we're talking about the innate ability to operate in a foreign language and, and, and of course, operate amongst a, a, a wide area of competencies. So, so sure, with maths, you can buy a calculator, and, and probably with language teaching in a few years, you can buy these instantaneous translating devices. But nothing can really replace the ability to use English naturally or use a second language naturally. And I think we've known this for some time. We know that students improve by, by using a language rather than just learning it. And, and of course, in terms of communicative competence, we know that it's been in the forefront of ELT for many years. And so we already know what we can do to help develop this in our learners. Um, we know that we want to achieve communicative objectives. And the way to do it is to, to actually get the students doing things in the English classroom in English, rather than just studying grammar uh, forms abstractly. And we can see that if we run student-centered classes, where our students are operating in English to complete activities and tasks, and we're exposing them to lots of natural input to help develop their receptive skills, and we're highlighting sort of chunks of functional language uh, as enablers to help them do this, then we're on the right track. Uh, so we have to make our, our lessons more authentic. And I see authenticity as a, as a gateway to, to communicative competence. Um, the trouble is, in, in our profession, there are so many, uh, so much information to process. Even something as simple as what is authenticity or what does authenticity mean can cause problems. Because here, here are a few, just a, a basic few different definitions of uh, authenticity. And it can get really confusing. What is it? Well, I think for me, if whatever material you use in a classroom is going to get the students communicating in English naturally, then that material is authentic. So I suppose, I suppose in terms of my definitions that I put on the board, the last one, is it fit for the learning process? Does it create tasks that the students will engage in natural English to complete. And of course with, with Pearson, we've been operating on trying to develop a course where authenticity is at the, the, the forefront and where we're trying to get people to communicate in English. Uh, with this wider world, we, we've got a little acronym, which is AIR. You know, everything that we do with it is authentic, interactive, and it produces reliable target language that we can use to, to improve students' communicative competence. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit from Wider World, one of the books now, just so you can, show, so you can see how we've done it. I'm going to show you something from uh, student book two. Obviously, you can see here with this double-page double page spread that we're looking at animals. And, um, and I've got a little task for you. Um, I want you to think of an animal that's also a verb. So, for example, a dog is an animal, and of course, he was dogged by bad luck is a verb. Or, or bug, you know, this thing's really bugging me. Um, just, just for these, these eight letters, A, A to H. So, so obviously, you've, you've got to think of another animal for B and another animal for D. Um, if you look at it, can you ant someone? Can you, can you antelope someone? Can you aardvark with someone? Hmm, probably not. Um, but just try and focus on those, those, those eight letters and see if you can come up with an animal that's also a verb in the English language. So, so let's have a look. OK, so, so how did you do? And I've got a few here. That looks like my one-to-one -one student. Badgering me, I've already said no. If you're a parent, you know what that is. Harmed up. Duck. Well, you know, you struggle sometimes. Uh, 
an egg isn't really an animal, but it's going to be. Fishing for information. Donald Trump likes to goose people, but in England we're a little bit more sophisticated, so we'll have a gander and have a look at some figures. And of course, my wife's hounding me to stop smoking. So, so there's a little activity for English teachers, and it could be quite pleasant. But is it fit for purpose? Um, has it got the students using English? Well, probably not. So, so, so let's have a look at what we're asking the students to do in the book. Obviously, the topic's animals. Obviously, the level is a lot lower. The level is, is, is sort of A2, A1, A2 sort of level. So we're, we're introducing a lot of visual clues. Uh, we're getting the students to, to, to look at the animals. We might get them to try and see how many they remember. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get them to listen and, and, and match the animals to, to, to what they can hear. And of course, one of the things you'll notice about the, the structure of this book is that most of the activities are pair activities or group activities because we really want to get the students doing things in English in the classroom. Um, we know that, that when it comes to, to actually doing tasks, and again, here's the second and the third task in the book, and you can see the second task we've got in pairs, and in the third task we've got in groups. Uh, we know that, that maybe they'll only spend a week or so or, or a couple of lessons on animals, and they might not necessarily remember the word dolphin. But if we're getting them to do the same functional things, and of course if you look at exercise three, here we've got a lot of descriptive language. So we know that if we're doing the same things all the time in English, these are the things that stick. And of course, we've known for some time that it's not about teaching the book. We don't stand there anymore and we sort of present grammar items. What we do is we use the book to encourage the students to speak English. And probably the most important things that we need to teach, and not the stuff that's in the book, but the language the students are going to use to complete the task. So, so here we've got descriptive language, and, and this is the sort of thing that students will use when they need to describe. They, they, they don't actually remember the word. They're circumlocuting around it. And of course, if we look at an A2, uh, this, this comes from the, the Pearson Tests of English, but what an A2 student can actually do, there's, there's not a long list of uh, notions of animals that they need. But what they do need to do is they need to do simple skills, things like identifying. Gone are the days where every student grabs their textbook and puts it out in front of them in the desk and they work through the textbook on their own. Probably nowadays a more realistic 21st century classroom is to have one book between two students and get them to use English to complete the tasks together then they might write or annotate the, 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 the answers if they need to. But we know that the real aim is to build up this operational level of English. So, so again, if you have a look at this, this, this activity from the same unit, we're asking uh, the, the students to guess which animals they see in the pictures. Uh, we can predict what type of functions will be reinforcing. Obviously, things like speculating or, or giving opinions or agreeing and disagreeing. This is the basic functional stuff that they'll be doing throughout the course. And obviously, we'll, we'll provide them modeling. We'll, we'll give a lot of input. We'll concentrate a lot on, on giving them audio input or video input. We're concentrating on giving them input just so they can see the language that's required to do it themselves. And Again, if we look at what's required from an A2 level, student, there is a finite list of exponents for doing the everyday classroom activities, and we want them to feel comfortable doing this in English so that they can build up on this communicative competence. Um, here's, here's the next exercise from, from the book, and, and of course, it's, it's a quiz, and again, it's a pair work activity. 
Uh, we've got a, a nine statements, and the um, here they are. So if you close a look at them, and the students have to work together, and again they have to, to discuss which of these nine statements are true or which of the which of the four facts are false. So obviously the first two are, 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 are true, but what we're asking the students to do is pretty much the same as in the previous activity: speculate give opinions, agree, and disagree. You have a chance to have a look at the statements. And of course, we provide the students with answers to the quiz. But the success is not getting the answers right. The success is being able to use English with your partner to speculate and give opinions. And it's this language that we're hoping to reinforce. Again, if you look at the instructions, as you look at the, the activities, you'll see there's a clear emphasis on getting students to do things in English. Exercise seven, in groups. Exercise eight, in pairs. Exercise nine, a little bit of personalization with, and again, finishing in pairs. Uh, and if you look at the blue text, because we know it's, it's demanding for, for students to be productive, we've provided them with a lot of modeling we provided them with the target language that we'd like them to use, just so we can activate it. As we go on, we've got a grammar le lesson. And of course, the grammar lessons are tied into the Common European Framework of Reference. So we've still got a, a clear communicative goal. Uh, so we're, we're obviously introducing, and I'll go back, sorry. We're introducing the, the language that we want them to use. We're showing them a context where they can use it communicatively. Uh, we're working a little bit with the, the, the text. We're mapping out and showing them the structures. We're giving them a little bit of guided work. And again, you can see there's a lot of oral input as well, because we want to model what we expect them to use. And gradually, we move towards this area where the students are speaking together using some of the structures. And of course, we always finish with an and you section where they can sort of take the language and bring it to life uh, and personalize it. Again, as, as, as we go on to, to the reading, uh, obviously reading is, is, is a skill that, that students do alone. But the pre-listening or the pre-reading activities, again, we get the students to, to, to do it in pairs. We get the students to think about it, to talk about it, to give opinions. Uh, we've, we've obviously put all of the reading texts on, uh, on audio, so we could, we've provided another layer of input for the students to have a look at. And of course, we're slowly getting them to look at the language that's introduced, and we finish with personalization. It's the same with, with the other grammar lesson from the same use, uh, unit. We're giving them a clear structure. This time, we're introducing the grammar through video. Uh, we've got the text right in front of the book, so we can work with it with the students. And I think what's important here is, as well as modeling it, we've, we've got chunks of interactive language that we're introducing so that we can help them with this. And of course, the important thing is we might get some discovery going. We might concentrate on pronunciation. But the, the key thing that we want them to get to is, again, in pairs, get them to use the language and finish with using the language in a personalized way. Obviously, because all of the students that we're teaching in secondary schools uh, generally have to take an examination that's mapped to the Common European Framework of Reference, that's mapped to what they can do. As you go through the book, again, you'll see a lot of discussion in pairs and a lot of modeling. But you'll see the type of activities that are normally in, in the exit tests that the, the ministry might impose or the, the, the mainstream test from, from Pearson or from Cambridge. Uh, the same sort of activities are there. But we really want to get them to use this language authentically and for personalized use. Um, even with speaking, we have to provide them with a model. We have to provide them with a lot of input. 
So again, we've got a lot of visual clues, we've got a lot of video, we've got a lot of text to deal with, we've got a lot of chunks of language to help them interact, and we're mapping out the, the, the simple exponents to be able to get them to do things in English. And of course, we're, we're, we're working with that language and those exponents, but we're always going to end up with getting the students to, to use that language in a natural way to talk about themselves. Even with writing, again, we're, we're, we're being very clear what we expect them to do, and we'll do some pre-writing activities uh, by getting the students to use English in class, and we'll map out, we'll give them a, a, a clear map of the language we expect, and then we'll, we'll get them to, to, to model that in some, some controlled practice, and then we'll get them to, to, to do something themselves. Even with the revision uh, sections after every unit, uh, we find that we don't want to make it dry. We want to show the students that the language is there to communicate. So they've just finished the unit on animals, rather than just give them the individual words. We've put chunks of language there that they can use to, to talk about their own pet or to talk about uh, why to have a pet and why not to have a pet. And of course, we're getting them to use the word list to, to describe things. And again, it's here that we'll put in the types of activities that, that we'd expect students to come across in exams. And of course, we've got integrated skills. So we've got a lot of speaking, we've got a lot of listening, and we're mapping it to as many different types of exams that are connected to the Common European Framework as, as possible. So uh, again, the Pearson Test of English has a role play and it has dictation. We've got these things in there as well. Um, and we've also included uh, project work, culture as well, and we're using videos for this. And of course, what we're hoping the students will, will want to do is map out uh, projects themselves using their own technology. So, so what you'll find in our projects, it, their projects are designed to get the students using the student technology themselves. And, um, and of course, we've got CLIL, and we've got quite a lot of CLIL there. And again, the CLIL is designed to get the students using English as well and is linked to project work. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the teacher choice. So, so obviously you wouldn't do every section, but you might decide to do some sections that are engaging for your students. The important thing is that you choose material that will actually get the students using English in class to complete it. Um, now, for, for many years, some of the teachers I've worked with have been very keen on these, these extra photocopyable resources that come in a, in a teacher's disc or, or a few years ago in the teacher's book. And I think these photocopyable resources, if the students see them, they feel, okay, this is, this is a communicative task. And so what we've done with, with Wider World, because we know that some teachers really like to exploit these, is that we've provided them with a number of different resources that are designed to get the students speaking. These are just the resources for the unit three from book two. And of course, you can see that there's such a selection, you wouldn't do everything. Now, one of the things that I think this is really good for is for recycling. So, so we know that, that, that once unit three is finished, it's not finished. We have to go back. We have to review some of the language. We have to get them uh, doing similar tasks. So by mapping out a lot of extra activities you can use the same unit for, it makes it very easy for teachers to go back and have some distributed recycling in their courses, which I think is quite nice. But I think with Wider World, the thing that we've really done that's innovative, <coughs> that's new, is the way in which we've approached video. Now, now video is not new. I mean, as I say, I've been teaching for about 30 years. And I remember when I first started using videos, they were on these big trolleys, and they had these big chunky VHS things. My first teaching job abroad was in, in Italy. And, and at the time, in the north of Italy, the cinema showed one film a month 
in the original language. Everything else was dubbed. So, so there wasn't a lot of choice for students and not a lot of exposure to students to, to natural language. So when Christmas came around, we put on a Christmas film or Halloween, we put on a ghost story. But, but these days, obviously, there's so much available to students through different streaming devices or downloading devices that there's no real need to, to expose them to a film or expose them to a short clip. They're already watching the clip on the way to school. But the important thing to bear in mind is that the students feel comfortable using this medium. And we know that, that, that there are many reasons to use video. Obviously, it's more motivating for the students and it enhances the learning experience. And Strangely enough, it can lead to higher marks in tests. I'll show you a little bit about that a little bit later on in this presentation. And of course, if we've engaged the students with something in the book, they can then go off and explore it using technology, and this will help develop learner autonomy. And of course, if we've got a, a big project, and we're providing video to help introduce the project, then we're enhancing teamwork and communication skills too. Now, Pearson have been working for BBC for a good number of years, and they've worked producing videos for, for adult books and secondary books for a while. But I think with this collaboration with Wider World, we've, we've reached a new level of collaboration. Because uh, rather than having a little bit of video at the end of a lesson as a sort of standalone free video lesson, We've embedded the video throughout the course. We've, we've said, you know, these days, students expect to use technology. They feel comfortable using this media. So we really need to make sure that the course is, is based and embedded on the video. So if we go back to Wide World Unit 2, or Book 2, this time we'll, we'll look at Unit 1, you can see that, that, that we've got a number of different video items or components throughout the, 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 the unit. And we're doing it in different ways. So, so for example, we've got a grammar lesson. Now, there's an awful lot of material available on YouTube or, or online. But actually, if you're, if you're a grammarian and you really want to choose a specific bit of video to, to reinforce a certain language point, it's almost impossible to find something that's suitable. So, so when we looked at Wider World, we had to create our own videos. So, so this is Wider World Book 2. It's, it's A2 level. Uh, we're reinforcing the present simple. So we've got a video with the same characters, the same characters run through it, and we've scripted it. Now, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of this video. You won't be able to hear it, but you can go uh, onto the platform afterwards and you can, you can spend time looking at it. The important thing is, I want you to notice that we're using a lot of nonverbal communication with our videos so that the students can see how important it is to use it for actual uh, communication. Here we have two of the main characters. Um, again, a lot of clear visual clues that you can use to build up what's happening. Um, one of the, the characters is waiting for her friend to come along to spend a little bit of time together. And of course you can see the friend thinks uh, that he's going to be able to play a little bit of music. He's brought his guitar with him. He's quite excited about it. But she has other ideas. She'd like to watch a, a video of a concert of some boy band. And so if you look closely, I know you can't see the, see the audio, but if you look closely at the, uh, the gestures and the body language,
So, so again, we're really exploiting the non-verbal communication. And it's so unnatural these days to just use audio only. I mean, how often do our students just sit in a, in a closed environment listening to, to something that's not music on their headphones for 30 or 40 minutes? They don't, you know. Even, even my, my two teenage daughters, they don't really use their phones to make phone calls anymore. They, they use WhatsApp or they, they use Viber to, to, to type SMSs. And when they do talk, is using some sort of video conferencing system. So we've, we've introduced, and, and if you look at the, the script from, from what you've just seen, we've introduced something that sounds quite natural, but actually is only using one tense, the present simple. So, so we've, we've spent a lot of time figuring out how to introduce language structures naturally and engagingly through context. Of course, we've got a lot of activities for the students to do after we've exposed them to this. And again, everything ends with a personalization. Now, the great thing about using videos to introduce uh, grammar is that when we need to recycle, we don't have to go back to unit one in the book and show them the, 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 the grammar tables again. We can just very quickly show them a little bit of the video. And of course, we do know that if we do have stories in course books, if we use stories in course books, there is an effect on test scores. Now, if we use just the general text, so, so in a lower secondary book or an upper primary book, we can have the same set of characters and they can develop a storyline and we can just have audio only. And there is an increase in grammar scores if we work with this. It's 17.5% almost. But if we use video, it moves up to 39%. So it's a huge difference in terms of working with it. And we've got videos not just for the grammar, but we've created videos for the, the, the speaking, the functional language. And, and of course, we use that for the, getting the students to be able to, to, to use basic functional language. And again, we've got the tape scripts right up there in the units. And we've got lots of chunks of interactive language to use. And we've highlighted the exponents that we expect the students to, 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 to use to complete the tasks. Um, we know that if we replace, and again, in white world, we've probably got more audio than any ever before but in, in, in lots of guises because we want to provide that input. We want to provide that model. But when it comes to actually concentrating on the grammar and concentrating on the, the, the basic functional language throughout the books, we've decided to use video to reinforce these as a more realistic way. And of course, what we want teachers to begin to develop is the fact that they're using a little bit of video in every class so that the, the students are, are exposed to a medium that they feel comfortable with. So, so we, we don't want teachers to prepare sort of separate lessons. We want teachers to use the video in the everyday lesson. And of course, one of the other things that we've done, as I said, and you're probably aware of now, uh, every activity or every lesson ends with some sort of personalization. We want to show the students that it's all about communication. And so what we've done is we've gone out into the streets of London with the BBC film crew, and we've recorded lots of non-native speakers attempting the same sort of communicative tasks we're asking the students to do throughout the book. And of course, this really reinforces that it's not just a dry, page-driven course, but that what's on the page is, is, is real language that we can show other, other, other learners trying to make attempts for. Um, and these are called the box box parts. And I think it's, it, it's quite useful because in, in many ways, in previous incarnations of secondary school books, we're just dealing with standard English. And yet, really, how many of our students are ever going to be in a situation where they're just going to use standard English? If they, if they work in a global company now, they might find themselves using English with German speakers or English with Spanish speakers. 
And so to expose them to, to, to natural uh, attempts at, at, at language can be a really good thing. And so these Fox Box videos are scattered throughout the units and really help motivate the students to see that the language is actually for communication. Um, also at the end of the unit, in the culture sections, what we've got is we've got authentic BBC documentaries uh, in engaging subjects. But what we've done is we split them into to two parts. So every documentary has part one and part two. And we've re-narrated the documentaries so that we can grade the language so it's accessible to students at that level. And we've, we've done some very clever things with the narration. So what we've done is used the target language that we want the students to, to concentrate on in the unit in the narration of the various BBC documentaries. And of course, the, 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 the length of these videos is designed to be no more than about three minutes because we know that's the optimum amount of, uh, of concentration time that these teenagers have. Um, and the other thing that I've said I've already mentioned, we try and get them using their own technology to create uh, videos themselves. And we know that there's research that, 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 that says if we get them to, to film or we get them to, to use technology, then we're concentrating on those, those 21st century skills, the four C's, if you like, of collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creativity. So it fits enforcing the students using English. And of course, just like the, 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 the general course book activities, we have lots and lots of additional photocopyable activities, which I think is ideal for, for videos, because we do want to show the students the videos again, maybe not, not in the same lesson, but maybe two months further down the road, so they can recycle the, 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 the language. And I think it's great that we've got these extra activities that we can use. So they've done the video, they've done the activities in the course book, Two months later, we show the video again, but this time rather than use the course book, we use the photocopy of all materials. And, and here, for example, is a sequencing activity for, for, for the uh, going to the cinema bit that we had a look at in the course book. So we can recycle the, the, the language very easily. And this is a role play from the, 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 the culture exercise. And, and it's not finished because we've actually included video as well in the, uh, the personal learning platform. Uh, My English Lab is, is, for people who know Pearson, is the standard language management system, is the electronic workbook, if you like. And what we've done is we've, we've embedded grammar videos uh, for self-study to reinforce the grammar points. Humorous little cartoons with this sick man character uh, to, 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 to help them see how it's used. So I think, I think if you look at uh, what we've done with Wider World, we've tried to give a lot of content. Uh, to, and, and some of it, I'm sure, is going to be very engaging for your students. And we've tried to, to, to offer a lot of the content in a lot of different ways. And we've got so many different tasks. We really, really, really want you to try and focus on getting the students to use English in the lessons while they use this book. So, so thank you very much for, for tuning in this afternoon and listening. I'm going to hand you back to, to Nikki now. Thanks a little bit for that. Um, we just had the one question. Um, uh, the BBC have been working with Pearson for a while. And there's just to know how is the collaboration on Wider World different to the other courses such as Speak Out? Well, with the, the other courses, uh, when we've worked with the BBC, uh, we've gone to their archives, we've selected um, some, some comedy shows or some documentaries, um, and we've used those in the course books at the end of the unit to revise the topics. This time around, what we've done is we've created with the BBC some very carefully scripted grammar and speaking uh, sitcoms, you know, so, so sort of documentaries. And we've also re-narrated 
the authentic documentaries so that we've been able to, to introduce uh, the language at an accessible level for teenage learners. So it's a, it's a sea change, really, in the way in which we're using the video. And we've scattered it throughout the units as well. So, so I think it's really worth looking at. Great. Thanks a lot, Philip. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Just to let you know, we were recording this webinar, and you will be sent a recording of it in a couple of days' time. And you'll also be sent a uh, certificate if you um, actually attended. So that will be in a couple of days' time as well. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.